Great. Excellent. Okay. Good. Yay, we made it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> Finally, we did. So lovely to see you again. And is it, I, I really, what I miss most about not being a judge on the Lush Spring Prize anymore is this the rhythm with which this beautiful community met and, and, and meeting you and, and some of the others in that team was just, it was always such a joy to spend those two days together. Yeah, I think the big thing was the people and mm -hmm. how diverse um, and wisdom too. So obviously we've missed you a lot. <laughs> And your yeah, your strong contributions and yeah. Mm. So you, are you still going with it? Um, um, no, well, so I can't really say because I don't know what is the lineup for the coming year. But definitely, we sort of contribute to what we think um last year looked like and so on as we go forward. Because now it happens every other year. So yeah, yeah, no, that's just. Yes, but yes, the last time I was there with uh, Gamma and Philippa yes, mm -hmm. from the old judges talk. so it was nice to meet the new judges so I guess it was good to help um, with the transitioning mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I remember Philippa's um, <laughs> called again the little cr cream pies that she brought us it was so yes. delicious <laughs> she was the best with the food yeah. she is <laughs> she still is <laughs> She's the best host. <laughs> so I the, normally in this series, I, I just stop people off by asking them when the passion for their work, the 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 thing that calls them from the depth of their heart and soul, um first became obvious to them. Like um when when did you get into this work and, and how did you get into this work? Okay, <laughs> that's such a huge question. Um, <clears throat> I guess I couldn't answer it without answering how I grew up. <laughs> I don't know how that will do to your time, but it, it won't be bad. Um, so I grew up in rural Zimbabwe in mm. Wange communal lands um, from the Debele tribe which is part of the Nguni tribe mm -hmm. that um, left South Africa during the war, during the Shaka times. So I'm probably from the, not probably, actually from the Zulu tribe roots, but the Tembo tribes under a king from the Tembo tribes. Um, so growing up, I had a beautiful grandmother. So unfortunately I was orphaned and then I also didn't grow up with my mom. Um, so we grew up with our grandmother, we were seven grandkids. Um, I was the oldest, and um, so in a household of eight females, so it was seven grandkids and my grandmother. And um, being rural and um, probably the things that influenced families in those times, it was usually just easier to get your girl children married, uh, also because we we belonged to a certain sect that my grandmother used to go to as a yeah sort of a religious sect, but it's not fully Christian. It's called apostolic. So mm -hmm. they used to marry girls very early, and I think it was an easier option to take. But my grandmother just didn't do it. It was it was a miracle. I don't know how she did that, but then it meant we had to work very hard to feed ourselves. We didn't have cattle, goats. We just had chickens. Um, but that meant we worked in people's fields. And most of the times when we farmed, it was either we're too late with the seeds or when we got help from the community, it was when everyone is done um, mm -hmm. doing their own cropping. So half the time, really, we didn't have food, not even half, most of the time. So I think internally, I had questions I would like to think because I don't remember those questions immediately but I naturally grew towards going to agriculture class. And in those times, um, I mean, that's in the nineties, my, 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 my classmates, the girl classmates didn't do agriculture. They all went to fashion and fabrics and food and nutrition. And I was with the boys in the garden. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I didn't do English literature because I thought there was a lot of reading. I wanted something practical. Um, so from there, my path of life, naturally drew me towards um, natural sciences, 
loving physical geography, eventually landing in the Africa Center for Holistic Management as an intern when I got a scholarship to go to university. By the way, all this time, my education is uh, sponsored by a family that I met only in 2018 um, from the UK. So my grandmother couldn't afford the school fees. And then from there, I got um, a scholarship to go to a university in South Africa. And my grandmother passes on after I finish just, just before I finish my high school. And then I remain as a child head <laughs> for our family in the fields. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot of interaction with cropping and just taking care of my uh, cousins and my young sister and just becoming an adult at a very, very young age of 16, 17, 18, 19, we were alone all that time until I moved to be with my aunt and immediately went to the university in South Africa by scholarship. And so from that time, when I checked into the Africa Center for Holistic Management, where they practice uh, holistic management, the framework, and you see it in practice, um, a center really founded by Alan and uh, Alan Savory and Jordi. Before you go on to, to, the, to the center, yeah. I'm just curious about that family and how, how they found you. And um, was there an organization behind it that supported cases like yours or was it very specific your case? Uh, it was, I, I, it was an, it was an old man, not very old at the time. He was called Mr. Victor Voss. He was from the UK. Um, I think he was one of those Christian missionaries. But okay, sorry, I thought I thought I'd lost you. No, I didn't. Okay, so he was one of those. It was like he was like a Christian missionary, but he also just did lots of charitable works. Um, mm -hmm. so I he he didn't really put that in the front, but only later did I learn that he, he was funded by a group of people from his church back in England. Mm -hmm. um, so he walked into our school and said, you know, I need uh, kids with, with promise, you know, um, but who can't afford um, fees. And at that time, you know, you're walking barefoot at school and clothes patched. <laughs> so you're called, you know, you're being called to the headmaster's office. You're like, what have I done? You know, those days. But <laughs> but then you only find out that actually there's such good fortune that you're being called for. And that's how I got funded. That was from form two. So after high school, there's um junior high school, form one up to form four. So by form two, um I was so blessed to then access this education. And you just got letters of interaction with the families back there who wish you well. And I tell you, you know, one day you will really make it and you will thrive and that's probably the greatest gift that you could ever give anyone if they have potential to be anything. Otherwise, I couldn't have never finished the very basic, what we call O level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could have never happened. Um, because through that, then I managed to then um educate my own uh siblings too, you know. Um, yeah, and so it's a thing that I carry very dearly, even now. <laughs> well, I mean it having an upbringing like that i'm less surprised how of of your managerial capabilities of holding everything you're holding and and doing all the work you're doing because if you had to start so early to um keep your own education going while you were taking care of all your siblings and getting like not just taking care providing the food on the table poof um <laughs> like, oh no. <laughs> no, no no really i mean that's it, it just it, stories like that make me always a little bit teary-eyed because they make me aware of how much for granted um people take privilege and even if you start your life like i do with a sort of deep commitment to gratitude and and um every day um saying thank you um it still takes a story like this to to remember how things that so many people in in my cultural background cohort people growing up in germany in the 1970s they just think that education and shoes and clothes and food and all of that is just basic that's what you get and then there's what else can i have um, um <laughs> So yeah, no, thank you, thank you for sharing that. It's 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 always um it's it's so, oh, it's so beautiful. Thank you. 
yeah. I think it's it's one of the healthiest things um, to be reminded of one's own privilege. Um, it, it just it feels like a sort of cleansing. Anyway, thank thank thanks for that story. And, and yeah, but you were just about to start the the amazing career story of of um, being like one of the central people of capacity building for regenerative agriculture in in, in your part of Africa. So, so when when did you get in touch with with um, the Savior Institute directly from or while you were at university or while I was still at university? Um, I think the curiosity grew, and I remember very well my degree program didn't really require that I I sign up for an internship, but then I heard about this center because now I was living in Victoria Falls with my aunt. Um, so I just went there for, you know, I could be an intern for a month every time I'm here on holiday. And I think my mind was blown <laughs> because, you know, like for the first time, you know, after coming coming out of university, um, mm -hmm. you are aware of physical geography, human geography, but everything is in silos, right? But then you get to this place where you find a rhythm basically even when they are moving their cattle their chickens and <laughs> goats and they tell you oh the chickens are picking out bugs and ticks and you know there's birds also wild birds that are on cattle and goats and then you have a community of people that are working on this and when you come through the gate, everyone's just telling you, oh, here, we do holistic management, which is a decision-making framework. Everyone's sort of like saying it to you. And you're like, okay, let's see this thing. So every month, as long as I was on holiday, I was at the Africa Center, either helping with the tourism side. Um, at that time, there was um, Alan Sand, Roger Savory, and um, the leadership there, Huggins Matanga and uh, Sani Moyo, who were there. And, uh, you know, they were just, post me anywhere where there was a gap. And I remember when I was done with school, I just found out like, so I'm done. <laughs> you know, what, yeah, what, what can we do? And literally I saw them create an opportunity for me, whether you're administering the training department or just helping produce printing materials. And then one beautiful day, I saw a man called Alan Savory old quiet man with his wife Jordi it was my first time and you know obviously you would have heard so much about this man now you would like have a presence um when he comes in and at that time there was a group um of scientists from the National Parks Association here between South Africa Zimbabwe Mozambique and Namibia so he was giving them a, a talk and taking them on a ranch tour at the learning site and I totally started attending every time he was sitting in with someone um like a group of people just to listen because even if he said the same things every time he said it differently and so that really grew the scope of my mind and as you say is one of the greatest mentors in regenerative agriculture uh, through the holistic management concept and i am totally one of those very blessed people who sat at his feet when he taught and <laughs> Half the time you're like, don't say it like that, <laughs> you know, because he's very passionate and everything. And so it's been amazing to work with him. Also, just realize how passionate he's been, how he gave his whole life to it. And I also feel like I did find my purpose through um, the work that Alan did. And um, I worked with communal lands, worked in training NGOs so that they also go and train their communities. And so I grew and grew and grew and continued to grow until I felt like, okay, I need to explore more of the regenerative world. And so I left the full-time employment in 2015. I left scared, just jumped out. <laughs> and I was like, what are you thinking? I'm also thinking, what are you thinking to myself? But, um, you know, there's only growth the moment you open more doors and the relationship with holistic management and the center, because I'm still an accredited professional with the Savory Institute only gets better because you get more experiences. Now you have uh, more friends, Regeneration International. We're all now like a big pool of people, you, Lush, mm -hmm. everybody. So it has really given me that wide exposure to the whole world from Africa to the rest of the world. And 
I mean, for those um, most people are now by now familiar with that, but maybe for those people who are listening who who are not familiar with it, um, mm. because pe people often think of Alan Savory as, oh yeah, he's the regenerative agriculture guy, but mm. but, but that the fact that holistic management is a management tool, um, a decision making framework that you could apply for all sorts Anything. of things, and he actually, I I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he actually advised military or something on using holistic management as a decision-making framework um so yeah absolutely and and some and for some it's it's nicer that you even think it's for regenerative agriculture when people hear holistic management they hear oh it's the cattle people <laughs> <laughs> but it's really broader and as you've well put it management framework decision-making framework that helps a manager, a land manager, a people manager, an economic manager, because those are complex uh, bodies of uh, things that we manage um, to manage connections and complexities that exist between the pieces of an economy, of a farmland, or of an organization. So like you say, Alan has really advised military, politicians, family farms, now we are using it more and more to get communities engaged in healing the bigger landscapes. Um, as I think as we move on, I'll share a little bit about the context in which um, I work here. But also I'm using the same framework. I feel like it's a thing to first <clears throat> use it on yourself. Um, what, what do I want? <laughs> you know, it's a very uncomfortable question <laughs> to say, what do I want? And Alan even... Um, moves it further to say I would rather die than not live this way <laughs> and it's it's not a perfect space but it's a thing that you have a context where you make your decisions from I'm doing this because this is what I believe um, I want to contribute to my world to my family to my farm um, I'm committed to learning what are the dynamics of this place that I'm managing so that's that's holistic management and People usually tend to relate it to cattle because obviously it was lent by Alan. Alan is a Zimbabwean biologist and he worked with uh, national parks in Zambia, Zimbabwe, and I think across Africa, to be fair. Um, so most of his learnings were when he watched behaviors of wild animals, um, the herbivores, how they related with um, hunting animals like lions, hyena, and leopard, how that impacted their behavior and how they kept moving. And so, yes, one of the greatest tools that has been added to the regenerative scope is the tool of uh, livestock management or grazing planning, what we call holistic grazing planning. So, yes, that's, that's one of the biggest tools, but holistic grazing planning in itself is not holistic management. Mm. <laughs> um, but it's one of the tools that holistic management helps us to get to. You you already answered it briefly, but but, but I, I'd love to hear a bit more detail. Um, how do you apply it in your own life? Like since you left now, um, don't work directly that often with the institute anymore. But but you you started a trust. Um, you're doing a lot of managing other people, but also managing your time and everything. Do you has it just become internalized, or is there actually a methodology that you're still kind of apply it on a regular basis i think because of the maybe the length of the journey somehow it's it's almost innate in me um but at first of course you make mistakes and um and these mistakes are supposed to also be lessons that really help you grow but i feel like for me to engage with community members i have to really be in a place of being whole myself because there are lots of dynamics um, at community level, which has impacted how I probably designed the small work that we're doing to see if, let's see if, what principles do we glean um, from this work and this journey? But I feel like it has to start from an individual. First of all, um, I think, yes, there's the uh, ecological part that I'm working with these communities to improve the broader landscape. So this becomes like the greater purpose or the backbone of the work that we're doing. But before we engage with the broader landscape, we have to engage amongst us as people. And um, because I'm also a facilitator, not only um, within my context, 
uh, of Wange, where I grew up, and these are my people. So you probably know the ROPs because you know the cultural ROPs, which is also a very big thing with holistic management because you want to build an ecological stability, economic stability, and social or cultural stability, everything in tandem or connected. Um, but it has helped me interact with, with groups that would have otherwise been difficult. And, um, you know, based on how I grew up, <clears throat> being female, working with sensitive things like livestock, <laughs> which is mostly a man's world um, mm -hmm. in this case. But, you know, there's a thing that uh, Alan always says. He says, you know, when you're managing land and nature, assume, always assume you are wrong so that you don't place your overconfidence and then leave all the procedures that are supposed to be followed. It's always nice to check with the land and your movement, you know, your, your, your things that you've drafted, especially now we're talking about holistic plant grazing, always relate to the charts and everything that you created because nature will respond in the way that it wants. Some of it is intended. That's what we were looking for. And some of it is unintended. It's, almost like blind spots that we didn't see, but because your hands, feet and mind and heart on, on the ground, you are easy, it's easy for you because it's a management tool. It's easy for you to see um, that we're sort of deviating from our thing. And then so you continuously monitor, control, replan, get back on track. But then when you are dealing with people, always assume that your assumptions about them are wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> so that you get your own experience um, from them. So this to me became very apparent when I was given an opportunity to go and uh, facilitate to a Samburu uh, tribe in Northern Kenya. So the Samburu people are first of all pastoralists. And you know, here I work with farmers with six to seven large livestock cattle, uh, a few donkeys and a few goats. There, one farmer will have 500. Oof. And yeah, so they're like the elders of pastoralism. Um, they're traditionally rooted and very patriarchal. Mm -hmm. And so one man can have three wives. Um, and, you know, the community is really guarded and safeguarded by the elders and warriors. And then women have their own place. Um, so imagine coming from a bit of a very different world in Southern Africa where male, female can interact and challenge each other face to face. And you're going to a totally different um, landscape. Um, so it can be intimidating, but I think that's where I saw for me being a holistic manager coming in. I'm going in as precious to meet the Samburu people. And they, they help you, they guide you in how you introduce yourself because they are calendars are marked by events. We don't have 2024. The elders say their calendars by the year of this, this. Then a younger um, program officer or the yeah the organization that you're working with, they, they'll tell you, oh, that's 1954, <laughs> you know, because this is what happened. So they want to mark their calendar by when Nguni girl from the people of Ndevele in Zimbabwe visited us to talk about our grazing lands. So you introduce yourself in that way. You give the elders their place. When the warriors come into the room um, for the trainings, they don't sit before they are comfortable with what you have to say. They literally squat. Mm -hmm. And so they talk, they, I was told um, when they don't agree with what you're saying, they'll just stand up and go. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what did I do to myself? Like, why did I agree to come here? Like, yeah. And then so you, it, it, the internal uh, processes of holistic management really helped my feet to stay on the ground. And I had the most beautiful 10 days in Samburu land. We sang songs when we were done working. We did whatever you could think of. We ate goat meat. We ate rice using our hands. It was so beautiful because I had to put down the guard Mm -hmm. and assume that my assumptions about these people are probably wrong. Let me just meet them for who they are. And you find that those structures work very well for the communities that they have for them to remain for so long in such a traditionally heavy environment. Yeah, so uh, yeah. So that's just a brief um, experience of how 
holistic management has helped me as a person. No, it's beautiful because it's uh, I I still find that managing one's own hurt and disappointment sometimes when you work because I also work in 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 a community context um, on a landscape scale, but with in in a place that I'm not from. Uh, like I mm. I left my home very early and I've never felt very German and haven't spent much time in Germany since I left with 19. But um, after all these moves and, and being deeply in love with the Mediterranean, because my grandmother gave me such a wonderful upbringing living in, in Italy with her um, on my holidays, mm -hmm. um, there's something that feels really rooted and resonant and at home here. But I'm also reminded by the people of this island that I'm not from here. And, and it's a particular island culture that will no matter what I do, um, always remind me that I'm not. Mm. Mm. I, I find just that little thing can sometimes really give me a lot of trouble because it it makes me makes me feel unappreciated or or, or hurt by by not feeling included uh, um, somehow. And and also, I clearly have ideas of how I would love to help the future of this island, but but the it comes with a preconceived idea. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it's this deeper process of, of listening and, and appreciating that um, just takes a lot of time. And it takes a lot of deeper personal practice of not getting reactive when, yeah. when hurt. And I think it's such a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a huge point because I feel like this work definitely has lots of energy drains that happen. <laughs> emotional roller coasters and sometimes fear um because obviously when we when you work with communities the thing is you can see like you say like you can see how the island can thrive from where you're standing but then <laughs> the idea is you have to wait for the other person on the other end to also see <laughs> And so you couldn't fascipulate them to seeing because as long as it's not from their heart um, that they are in this journey for real, um, you will always be frustrated to then shoulder the whole load all your life. And I feel like this, that's a very unfortunate place to be. So, and sometimes the pain can't be ignored or avoided it's uh it's human nature it's human communities and uh, even the environment that we manage you experience lots of grief because mm. you also don't <laughs> sometimes you have certain expectations from the land or from the crop field but then nature has got its own ideas at that point um yes you accept and embrace the lessons but there's a, a portion of you that grieves uh, what could have been um so then there you also have uh, support you need support supportive communities, friends, or people that work in the same environment who are also open to chatting. And sometimes just a text. I have, I have a good friend. Her name is Lori. She's, um, I think you know Lori, Soft Food Alliance here in mm -hmm. Wange. They once received um, a, a, an award for Lush. Yeah. She's really a good friend. And then I have international friends, um, Judy Schwartz, Diana, Alex, <coughs> Cindy, and then you have uh, family who are like friends. <laughs> and then you have Regeneration International, a whole pot of other friends and passionate humans where you all have to continuously plug in to re-energize because the dynamics keep changing. The pressure um, from the, I'm looking for a better word, but like from the other practitioners who are not yet aware of um, the power of regeneration that we need to be many more clusters around the world doing this for us to really realize the full potential that this thing could bring as a solution to the current crisis in the world so there's all that pressure from local to a global space and sometimes you're like you know I'm, I'm such I'm in such a small corner here in Wange I don't even know if we have a space in the world to really then express what is possible. But thankfully, because of these kind of recordings, um, Facebook, Instagram, you get to share the smallest um, uh, wins and 
<laughs> it's obvious that if this was done in a bigger scale, we have a solution here for the whole continent, things like that. Right. So yes, the idea of waiting and uh, continuously listening it's, it's, it's a self-discipline. You get hurt and find ways of healing and um, keep moving, yeah. I, I loved when I, I looked at um, the way you describe your passion in, I think it's in your LinkedIn um, profile, and um, the way you open up by saying what really gives you the energy to do what you're doing, it's not outcome based. It's based on knowing the potential behind the methods. Like it's it's it, like basically having seen the the yeah. beauty of humans healing landscapes together with more than human beings working on the landscape. Um, like it, I just love the reframe of it's not sort of. I, I can see the potential that we can do all of this and heal all of this. The the the, the energy the way i understood it came from simply the method works and it heals yeah. them and that's where my energy comes from and, and i think just that reframe is actually really powerful because if you too much with the don't you see we need to apply the method everywhere now and and if we don't then everything is too late yeah you, you're again coming with too much energy that wears you out but if you just say how wonderful that the that that it actually works that we can heal yes. and uh, yes, we can heal land. The design looks different in different places. Um, and the idea is, I know there's a term called best practices. I think each place has got its own best practices that don't look similar to the other place. So um, we have an opportunity here to really help heal where we are coming from. And, um, you know, working with communal areas, especially the site, if I could share a little bit. We, 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 we are in the midst of many challenging things from weather extremes to land degradation that is carried on for years. And then that brings about um, poverty and scarcity of very basic uh, resources from food, um, financial stability for people to take their children to school and just resources in the community. Um, we are also in the uh, buffer zone of the national park. So on the other side of the road is a national park. On the other side of the road is a community. So the national park is a thriving place with wildlife. Um, but then there's what we call the human and wildlife conflict, which is an unfortunate description of an interaction of wildlife and communities uh, where lions can come and capture uh, cattle and predate and have food from, um, from communal land. So you are building all these bridges and gaps um, for communities that have gone through turmoil for many years. And um, so as uh, the work that we do here at Google Trust, we are very passionate about creating abundance. First mindset, not, not abundance in what you can handle, but first from the space of thinking, from scarcity to abundance thinking, the fact that we can, first of all, turn around the narrative. Um, second of all, we create um, a communal vision of values, uh, who we are, uh, what we want, what is the future resource base, like in the future, how do we want to be perceived? That's like our behavior. How do we relate? When people look at us, who do they see us as? And um, the land base that we manage, how does it look? How does it continue to support this life that we want for generations to come? So yes, this, this can be done in a multi-million dollar project, but I feel like in that scope of my multi-million dollar project, you need to have small pockets mm -hmm. of um, people who can facilitate this, who are culturally and locally relevant with obviously the, the technical knowledge that is needed, but also people who are able to break down that knowledge so that it's chewable in the communities because most of this work anyway is really local wisdoms um, that people are aware of. So you're sort of rekindling this awareness and this idea that we can actually do this and work um, on our own. And uh, for me, my greatest privilege has been to be on the front lines of designing for five villages. Um, 
and we are using a cluster strategy. So we started with three and then added on two according to how they share boundaries and the readiness of the next community. So um, as we as we progress, you see that there are lots of pillars that are needed to support this work. And I feel like these pillars help this work move for a longer term, such that even if I am withdrawn, uh, what sort of structures are present in the communities to carry the work forward? Um, and when people see results, the energy really increases. Uh, and so we have a challenge here to keep designing, to not stay stagnant. Um, and yeah, we can get into the technical details if you like. So how, how does um, Igogo Trust, do, do you actually hold land and custody in the trust or do you do is it a trust that works with other people who have the land holding it's a trust that so Igugu trust becomes an entity for us to work with communities because we also report to local government um the work that we do so i work with rural uh, communities here in zimbabwe the land tenure system is it's state land that is uh under the custody of uh, the tribal leaders or traditional leaders. So we work under a chief, a headman, and traditional leaders called village heads. So we work with 10 of those village heads in the five villages. And so the, the, the management strategy of the land in itself just tells you that there is no single decision maker. For you to implement a holistic plant grazing, you need everybody on board. Uh, we always say to, to, to plan holistic grazing, on this little chart that I'm carrying, yeah. This little chart, <laughs> you need about 30 minutes. You can you can fill this thing in of, you know, what kind of land do we have? You know, how many hectares and how does it look? You can condition score and everything. In 30 minutes, this will be done. But implementation is a totally different story. So <laughs> how do you build that consensus um, for people to then start following the grazing plan? Um, and over time, we've learned that you couldn't leave the social piece behind. Social coordination is that space that brings people to a liking for collaboration because you have to build relations within the community. Uh, farmers have histories. <laughs> Families and clans have histories. So-and-so is a witch. So-and-so's grandfather had an issue with my grandfather, so we cannot work together. But then the holistic context, the one that I just described, is the one that brings us together to say, hey, we are literally looking beyond what has been our problem, but we are saying, let's redesign our landscape so that our grassland is able to capture water, uh, improve our underground water storage, have these grasses become solar panels, that can capture all this beautiful sunshine and our animals can eat. When our animals graze, we have manure for our crop fields. Uh, we have, in case our crops fail, we have animals that we can sell for our livelihoods. And besides, a person with livestock here, that's such a huge symbol of pride and wealth and everything. And so pulling all those pieces together, you have the landscape regeneration at the cap or as the main um. Uh, movement, but sometimes landscape deterioration is really not um, a priority to communities. They can tell you we don't have food. <laughs> yeah. And so what is your entry point? What are the key drivers in this community of people? Um, so I've, I've really watched many different communities. Some of them, the health of their livestock is a key driver. For my communities, they are agro-pastoral, having food on the table is a key driver. If you can show us that we can improve the yield um, and the promise of using livestock to improve your landscape, what we have learned in one season, you can improve your harvest, you can improve your yield. And a few people can want to try it. When we started, only 12 households said, okay, we'll try this out. <laughs> like, okay, let's try. But the idea is, I know the broader um, benefit of healing the landscape. So then you drop in the idea that, do you realize that without a healthy grassland, your livestock will come to your crawl or your enclosure and have no poop in their bellies. <laughs> so a healthy grassland is still needed 
to have food in the stomach of an animal so that it dangs and urinates and gives you manure while your land is also healing. So that's how these things are tied together. And now when you talk about improving soils in the croplands, and then people really have to bring their animals together because each household has got like six or seven animals. Um, so I've literally seen it grow from 12 households to 25 to now 82 and now almost 100 wanting to improve just the harvest and the yield. Mm -hmm. And remember, um, we always have a funny way of, of sharing the story of how people can improve their crop fields using livestock. Because I have six cattle, the impact <laughs> is not significant. But the idea of crawling animals in croplands, you need your neighbor's animals. So mm -hmm. it's like a funny banking system where you take all your money into my account <laughs> for a week. And it's 10 of us. You've, we've brought our six animals together. So we have 60 in one crop field. So we have like $60 in my account. Mm -hmm. Somehow when your money sits in my account for a week, it leaves an interest deposit, <laughs> dung and urine. <laughs> and then it has to go to our neighbor. So I have to trust you that when I bring my money to your account, you will also bring yours to mine and you will take care of the money. So you, you have to count the animals in the morning when they go out to graze make sure they are in good condition when they come in the evening and the crawl is secured. So we trust you with our money. So this money moves across accounts, but leaving dung and urine and then waiting for the rains and then we can crop. And, so, you, just, and you just said it also leaves trust. It leaves relationships. Yes, it leaves time, relationships. Every time you've done one more circle, you have yeah. more confidence that that neighbor is taking care of your yes. money. And yes. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And from there, you, 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 you've done lessons. You're now doing the action of uh, impacting croplands. You have to celebrate those efforts. So we work with the agricultural extension officers to then sort of do farmers do self-assessment. How did we plant? Because once you have done the impacting, now you have to bring in the regenerative agriculture principles in cropping, mixed crop, live mulch, cover, standing legumes, grains, multiple grains in one cropland. Now you're creating resiliency for longer dry spells because here we have long dry spells that are unbelievable sometimes. But you see that people sail through and um, the general um, the result that we have gotten here is one, animals are better taken care of because farmers interact with their animals now throughout the year. And then two, you have at least twice the yield from what you are used to from your blood when you use synthetic inputs. Um, so you can sense that farmers are really like getting um, towards um, this um, trust and confidence also, you know, because for years we've been taught put synthetic fertilizers, use these uh, chemical inputs and everything. But then when you are changing the narrative, it takes time also for people to settle in with the idea. Um, so last this last season, we were hit by a very heavy El Nino um, effect, um, such that we only had honestly less than 20 days of rain uh, when we are supposed to have at least a rainfall in a span of four months. So we just had a short stint of very heavy storms and the rain went away. <laughs> so it needed serious planning and being on top of your game with your holistic grazing plan because crops generally didn't have hope. Maize was totally hopeless. I mean, in this particular season, the maize industry was really put to shame because no maize made it mm -hmm. in, our, in our environment. Um, and it was very unfortunate and very sad to see because farmers have loved maize for such a long time. But it was also an opportunity to then really show that traditional small grains can withstand these kinds of um, environments. Legumes can withstand. So you can have groundnuts. People still harvested some groundnuts. They harvested some uh, squashes. They harvested some traditional small grains. And then maize totally didn't make it, almost 100%.
So that's also a lesson to say, okay, maybe lesser and lesser towards maize, but more and more towards traditional local grains. Um, now you're creating a narrative. Yeah, go. Just one one thing that, that so I don't forget it, because I like with you working patiently over time with families by family expanding these these networks of collaboration to heal the landscape um and put food resilience um and community resilience uh, in in people's reach um do you find that there is still actively agro industry players that with much more money than I Google Trust go into these communities and keep people um in a in a loop that is take our chemicals and produce ridiculous crops for export? Or um is that is that not so strong in your area? So here without without the word export, but um the narrative that you've just spelled out is, is literally an everyday occurrence, um, which is one of the energy drains that I was talking about, such that when you feel like you've built something beautiful, mm -hmm. there comes, and I, I like to use the word well-meaning, well-meaning, big grants <laughs> to the community in millions. Um but they have a totally different mandate and they have a push of something that we are all trying to say, hey guys, here is an alternative. In the other world, they've seen that it doesn't really work, but then these are new injections into communities, financially backed up. And so farmers usually tend to, you know, because of the social issues, they tend to lean more towards someone who said they have like 3 million as a grant. And then Google Trust is like, <laughs> you have beautiful knowledge and a beautiful intention, but not so much money because also in the end, it's not the money that will do the work. Um, we literally almost don't have to buy anything except crawling materials, uh, pay stuff, be able to take care of our animals and maybe improve communal breeds develop business strategies in the communities. So it's not financially heavy, though there is need of finances. You find that a medium grant can go miles um, uh, of, of impact. Um, so yes, there is that um, small, not small, but big, big unfortunate um, situations of opposing programs, mm -hmm. which can also be a very big stress to a person who's a facilitator, uh, almost feeling like every day you're threatened <laughs> that communities will sway and um, go the other way. But I, I feel like the kind of work that we've designed, one patch of crop field at a time, the truth uh, suddenly dawns to farmers. And I feel like one day we'll really see a turnaround of transitioning. I feel like our trainings are also enabling introductions of transitioning. Hey, we can totally move to synthetic fertilizer free zones. And I don't know how the reaction will be when everything gets bigger. Because for now it looks like, oh, that's a small pocket. But then it's a small pocket of actions by eGoogle Trust, by Soft Food Alliance, by uh, Africa Center for Holistic Management, by partners in the East and the North and in Zambia. So one day all those clusters create a big, um, um, you know, community of practice. And eventually we have national networks now that are really uh, enlarging the voice of agroecology, regeneration, um, knocking on policy doors. I'm part of uh, Seed and Knowledge Initiative, which is an African, a Southern African initiative. And then Alliance for Food Sovereignty, which is Africa-wide with the Healthy Soil, Healthy Food Initiative, we're really knocking those big doors, but all from the knowledge from the ground. So there is that hope. So even if you find uh, a few punches on the ground that are working against what you are trying to build, I think at a national, continental level, there's lots of support also. And internationally, you have uh, organizations like Lush Spring Prize supporting this work. You have Regeneration International, Savory Institute. I mean, there's many that I probably couldn't even mention. Um, so you just plug into those uh, networks as well for more inspiration and then go back. <laughs> <laughs> 
you um with your work in southern kenya that you mentioned um but it's, as as you were speaking, I was thinking even even in agricultural contexts here in Spain or in in other European countries, there is a, is a situation that farmers who are locked into a particular way of doing things, um, mm. even if they can see that that way of doing things is degrading things and getting worse and worse, and the conditions aren't getting better, um, the the risk of shifting the system into something else and sometimes the necessary loss of harvest in the mm -hmm. transition um, mm -hmm. is, is a sort of I can't go there because I don't have the money to not have an income from my harvest for a season. Yeah. Um, is that an issue in, 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 Africa as well, in your context as well. Um, like, do, do, does I Google Trust sometimes also ensure people that if you change your pattern and something happens, we we will support you? Or how how, how does that work? Yeah, so I, also, yeah. yeah maybe I'm add something else to the question. There's something else I was thinking of, which was well, I mentioned um, Southern Kenya. Um, they have these. Um, land conservancies that somehow um, invite farmers into a larger network where they farm in such a way that the wildlife isn't negatively affected by it. And, and then mm -hmm. they, they get some money from the um, tourist lodges. Um, yeah. Do, do, do these systems work in, in Zimbabwe as, as well, or is it different? Um, I think the conservancy strategy has really worked very well in Kenya, both uh, both the Samburu and Maasai, uh, the Maasai Mara regions. And uh, I think in Southern Africa, honestly, the only communities that have tried the conservancy strategy are in Namibia. So this uh, the concept, I think, is slowly coming towards uh, us. So in terms of uh, financial... Uh, reimbursements or helping the transition, we haven't had um, a, that great success. But I can attest to the fact that I think in Kenya, it's been really amazing to see um, the core relationship between livestock, wildlife, and the herders who are moving livestock. Um, and then in our case, I I I truly believe in small transitions because I think you want someone to first see where they are going and they can be adding acre by acre every year until they eventually are out of the chemical uh, or synthetic fertilizers. That's what we do, at least as the Google Trust, because we don't have structures to then financially back up farmer transitions. But it's a model also that could really work, especially with commercial farmers. If uh, whether governments or or funders that could fund regenerative um, work could really support, especially private farmers. Because also I feel like private farmers are needed um, in this space to also really transition out. Because especially um, in the Eastern side of our country, and um, there's lots of farmlands that are still really stuck in industrial agriculture. So that model would work as part of helping to transition. I think we have a lot of work in the regenerative movement. For now, we are building enough evidence that this works. And through the networks in Africa, the agroecology movement is really um, shining, um, especially in the seed and food systems uh, department. We are also plugging into that, relating uh, the seed and food systems with the broader landscape regeneration. But then unfortunately in Africa, thousands of hectares of land need regenerating. So we're talking beyond crops. So we need the relevant tools now to be supported by policy because once policy or governments can support grassland regeneration, we know that funds will then start to go towards that. And then policies will be made in favor of contextual healing of one rangeland after another. And that's bigger and better for the broader um, continent. You have, like for example, we manage 2000 hectares and that's just such a small community. And yeah, so 2000 hectares of grazing 
and then about 5,000 belongs to the forestry. And we are also part of that management. And that's just a small cluster re regarding how many other millions of hectares need attention um, across the continent. So I feel like we really need that bigger transitioning beyond just food systems, beyond how much food did I produce? How is the health of my bigger landscape and the ability to capture water? Because water harvesting tools are necessary but then if you have 2 million hectares to manage, how do you do that? What is the tool that is needed? Um, yeah, there, yeah. There's, there's a scaling there of how, how do you, yeah. like the conversation I had um, with Natalie Topa um, about her work um, at the at the farm scale, um, doing the slow it, spread it, sink it and heal the farm scale hydrological cycle is, is is one thing, but then how to do it at the bioregional scale or the landscape scale um, is, is a different type of um, re-supporting the, 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 the whole watershed to become more capable of storing the water that, that falls. Um, and have, have you, because you mentioned earlier that your work is becoming more and more at the landscape scale, um, mm -hmm. which organizations are you working with there? And So we have, um, I think at a broader landscape in Zimbabwe, we have what we call the PELAM network, which is um, a national network that brings together small organizations that are doing this work and we are cross learning um, across um, each other's work. So about two weeks, yeah, two weeks ago, we had 55 um, people that came so that we did learn together on this side of my world um, by with Igugu Trust. So it was eight, eight organizations that are doing holistic learning lives of management across the country and um, all together 12 that were interested in knowing how to move forward to heal the bigger grassland. Um, and so those pots of learning, you then have um, communities taken by Pelham Network to participate in national dialogues where you bring ministerial uh, departments from the government of Zimbabwe to share the kind of work that we do on the ground. And these stories, as they feed up to policy, you can sense that there is now also organizations that are moving towards helping the government structures to then create agroecological policies that will support farmers in implementation and maybe intentionally also direct funding towards helping farmers. So that's the broader landscape um, that I was mentioning. And then in the Southern African region too, we are creating courses, curriculum, how do we then continuously create experiences for people, whether it's a consumer, they have to experience where this food came from. They have to experience where their piece of meat came from. So you want everyone to be exposed to this so that they intentionally support um, this kind of work that we're doing. Because in the end, even if you heal the landscape here in the corner of Wange, where I am, if you don't feed to the bigger uh, movement in the country and in the region, the story just remains in this corner. And how do we then um, exponentially improve or scale up this uh, according to how it works in the next community or the neighboring country? There is no way of doing it if we do not plug into the networks that have been built countrywide, um, regionally and in the sub-regions, and then eventually internationally. I feel like the network uh, loop is needed to share lessons but also to take action and to also encourage action, especially to the powers that be in the political I think, realms. Yeah. I mean, I completely, it's a really important point you just made. Yeah. Um, and from my personal experience is that there's, a, there's always a tension between the amount of work that is that needs to be done in the community, on the land, where your physical body hits the ground, like where you're at, like your region. And then there's the need to coordinate all the good people that are doing this work in the regions um, with each other so they can learn from each other and support each other so you can tell the larger story and, and, 
and also re as you also said sometimes it's it's simply knowing that other people are doing it elsewhere that gives the energy to to say okay mm -hmm. there is a bigger picture in in defining itself but i find that there's a real tension in terms of time management um between how much energy do I put into the network and how much energy do I do on the land? Because um, if you do too much network and the land collapses or, or the, the, the crops die or, or whatever, then um, that doesn't serve anybody. Uh, how, how do you dance with that dynamic? I'm not even laughing. <laughs> I, am... <laughs> I am totally surprised because you're bringing this up. Um, I think my team and I were just talking, like, guys. I think this year that's enough networking because <laughs> half the time you are as much as there's a need to harvest the story of what's going on you don't want to focus so much on harvesting the story because it becomes extractive again because the idea is I totally don't know how the balance will come about because there's such an urgent need to share what you have found and at the same time, a need to really focus on the design so that you can continue to say, hey, we have seen another, you know, we've hit another stream of how this work can expand. I do not for a single moment believe that this work is structured and stagnant. It grows, it evolves, it keeps moving. One day, one pillar will wake up not being needed, and then you have to move. What is the next pillar that is holding the fort at this moment? So yes, the balance, especially between networks, especially the parent networks, I'll call it the parent networks because for lack of a better word, there's, they also have some form of unseen pressure to really keep sharing, you know, because they want to knock on the policy doors. And then that pressure, <laughs> you know, naturally descends down to network members. Um, and the detail of work that's needed, it's quite heavy. That's true. Um, but I feel like the more organizations do this kind of work, pressure gets relieved from uh, then because the next time we are working with one partner, we're learning from one, one partner and they're feeding back. And next time we're getting case studies from another partner, there has to be a balance like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we are all still figuring it out because sometimes there is lots of pressure. And... I find that lots of talking sometimes doesn't really yield results. So we're better off on the ground, but at the same time, we're better off sharing. So <laughs> it's a it's a dance that is not perfect. And I don't know if it will be perfect anytime soon, but I feel like the more partners jump on into the networking space, the better the pressure on everyone. Mm, that's that's an interesting. Yeah, point. yeah. Um, before we wrap up the there's something that I would just love to capture from your experience. Um, because I, like when we first met at, as judges of the Lush Spring Prize, that was really the first time in my life that um, I was uh, in a role where I could help or influence how funds were being distributed to worthwhile projects. And, and since then I've, I've ended up in a number of groups and contexts where where family offices, philanthropic foundations that work on large landscape scale re regeneration are, are interested in in improving how they do what they do. And and so mm -hmm. for me, um, having somebody with such experience over so many years, um, I would just love for you to to maybe say like both with regard to the different types of funding what works better for you, what works less well for you. I, I understand that um, Google Trust has some kind of government funding as well as foundation no. funding. No? No. no. <laughs> it's all... <laughs> Tell me, how, it's how, all, how do you... It's all foundations. <laughs> yeah. It's all, sorry, I didn't hear that. It's all? Um, just uh, small grants from foundations. Um, foundations outside of Zimbabwe or in, inside? Outside. Of outside yeah yeah and but you still do need to like as a trust you need to work with the government or because it's strategic to work with the government no as as a trust i think it's strategic to work with the government because we are all partners helping fulfill government mandates yeah. 
exactly. Mm -hmm. So yes, so we need that support and that partnership with government and we report um, to the local rural district govern governance um, to share like what targets we have managed to fulfill and they obviously stake it into their own um, government plans and they can share that, okay, we're achieving this uh, through this partner, if we could trust. But yeah. what I've noticed is that in many, many places, it seems, mm -hmm. the, there are different levels of NGOs or actors at the landscape scale or local scale um, mm. in that are supported by somehow philanthropic money to do good work mm -hmm. in their region. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's they almost it's almost like they fall into two broad categories. There's the the ones that are quite small, running on a lot of passion, very connected to a community in a particular context, doing really brilliant work at a shoestring, at, at very, very, yeah. very, very, very little money. And, and really ultimately every bit of money that is given to them is match funded three times by the passion and commitment of the people working um, over time more than they should. Um, that sounds like you're describing me <laughs> exactly. and my friends I, and colleagues here. Exactly. So. <laughs> and, and, and pretty much most of the projects that are at the scale of the um, most of the organizations that we had to deal with with Lush Spring Prize, apart from maybe the established organizations, um, the, the smaller, younger projects were all like that. Uh -huh. And yeah. but, but then I'm noticing there's are these other organizations who have made that jump into being and I don't know if this is always a good thing, being a lot more structured, having a website, having all the documents that a, a kind of due diligence process from a very big funder would require in terms of the accounts and the mission statement and the strategy and the long-term plan and the deliverables and all these framings that are enabling constraints uh, and sometimes more constraints than enabling. Um, mm -hmm. And these organizations, they suddenly deal with sums that are at least times 10, very much times 100, what Igugu Trust works with every year or any of mm -hmm. these other smaller organizations. Mm -hmm. And while just giving more funding to an organization can also kill it, um, I'm just like, how do we build that bridge of helping the right organizations to mature enough that they can get bigger funding without turning into too big of an organization that doesn't have the community grounding. And it becomes like another white so, elephant because then you just be, you, you get stuck in repetition. Um, okay, I think the funding question is a very important uh, question, especially based on the fact that, um, okay, that's very, um, <laughs> I am feeling like crying. Because um, as a person who started with her own small resources, the, um, the pressure of, you know, where will I get the next amount to do ABCD is a lot. I recently re read um, a beautiful article from Sarah Kublatin. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm meshed her, her, her surname right there. But um, I felt every word that she wrote about the pressure of running a genuine small organization with genuine intentions, but the, the nature of the funding landscape is not very accommodating mm -hmm. of, 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 of work like that. Yeah. So I think it's a thing to accept. I'm very grateful for the funders that stepped into the vision um, and trusted us when we really didn't look like anything. I, I had a tiny car that would get stuck in the mud when we were trying to go do some work. And and farmers, at the same time, I used to NGOs who would come with millions of dollars and your budget has got nothing to do with millions. If anything, you're saying, hey, we're going to cook a meal for this big workshop. Can you please bring some of the food? <laughs> I'll bring some too. <laughs> but that's a model that started because we didn't have funding and I haven't dropped it. Even if we then got funding, we still contribute meals together. 
it, it's now part of creating generosity and abundance thinking. So there are small uh, grants or from foundations. There are foundations that can fund you like what we call seed funds mm -hmm. for you to improve um, your team. My voice is a bit shaky now because it's a very... No, no, it's a touchy it's, thing. It's a very deep journey. Um, they will fund your... They will give you what we call seed fund for you to improve your visibility. But the seed fund will come after you have shared a bit of your story. So that means after you've done a little bit of digging on your own, um, and that is purely on passion. And like you say, and lots of overtime and lots of thinking and designing. And I'm grateful for the seed fund that I got uh, from the foundation that funded us, <laughs> Klein Family Foundation, it was just a miracle that we could get that amount for three years that gave us a shape to develop a team because we have a structure of community-based coordinators. And now I have a few team members that we are together here in town. And then we go to the community once a week um, because now there's a structure on the ground in the community that is now working. Um, it takes off pressure off of me. Oh, sorry, I have to say me. <laughs> Uh, because then you are a facilitator, you are designing the program, you're the one who thinks, what are we going to eat for this workshop? And like, where am I getting the fuel to get in the community? And the fundraiser. <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't happen to anyone for a long time. It has to be for a very short time. Um, and then from there, um, we got a mentorship through an organization called Org Foundation. They also gave us a seed fund, but then they said, you know, you guys have lots of potential, but we would like you to get into a mentorship to help you develop into mm -hmm. a fundable program, fundable I, thing. Yeah. I, would, I don't want to interrupt you, but I wanted mm. to register another question with this. Mm. I have seen that kind of approach and mm. I it raised all sorts of alarm bells with me. Like I've seen that one guy once at a meeting mm. brought his, oh, here's what we do when we identify a really good um, NGO in Africa that does good work in a small community context. This is how we take them to scale. And then he showed how he was doing these trainings and da, da, da. Mm. And I, mm. I just felt like, oh, this is how you kill them. This is not how you <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's like you said, the structured place is good for receiving funds. But if you lose your fabric of what has kept your design going, yes, you're about to also die mm -hmm. because then you get to this comfortable place and then you relax. But what we've done is um, what they did was the mentorship is not by the funder himself. Mm -hmm. There is a local organization. Um, thankfully, they are just across the border, Zambia. They're called Time and Tide Foundation. They've also worked with communities in the same context as us, but what the mentorship has been doing is they're not really bringing in what we should do. They're just almost like taking what we've carried in the heart and expressed in the website. They're just saying, you know, you could create this into, you know, these structures. And now we are going into that space of, hey, let's now fix the, the accounts so that you are then fundable. But maybe this is so that we can have the projects part of the programs that need finances. There is a need for finance. That's one. Two, there is a need for finance for people to get paid well. Because as we grow older, um, how are you doing your savings? Like in the end, you want to feel gratitude across the whole space of your life, socially, ecologically, and economically. Your environment is beautiful, but then you don't want to also um, continue to struggle, especially if you have team members. I feel like it's fair because you get people wanting to sort of um, employ them or poach. We call it poaching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when someone sees, sees a group of people that have been designed and developed uh, skills, but then they don't have like a stable environment in their organization uh, for them to feel secure to work. So it's also necessary. But I feel like now it's up to the organization. It's up to Igugu Trust to make sure that they keep who they are in the tabs as they progress. And so eventually, what really, I, I feel like what really makes our colleagues and 
us in this space fall is to put your eyes on the money. Again, you, you've become a sort of reductionist. You're just looking for money to keep your work going. What else has kept your work going? What are the other important pieces? So this, this definition, this defining yourself and your holistic context will help you not take funds from everywhere else. It matters where money comes from. It matters what is attached to the money that's coming. Are you able to fulfill that without disrespecting the people that you work for? It's like when you've eaten um, food in the, in the workshop and you know there were 300 people, but like maybe 20 of those people couldn't write. So maybe they couldn't fill in the attendance register. You 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 want respect. Yes, can we write your name down? But if we didn't write the name down, can they still be counted as they came? You know, because sometimes when it comes to funding, how do we validate that there were 300 people? And that sort of really <laughs> doesn't sit well. <laughs> so so what are the strings attached to this funding? Mm -hmm. You know, is it respectful to you as the organization, the individuals in the organization? and the community. And yes, you have a big responsibility to be a good steward of public funds that everyone has worked so hard for. Because when they fund you, it's an issue that we trust you. Then mm -hmm. you have to put your house in order, make sure that you have your respect with you in the whole process and respecting the people that you work with. Mm -hmm. Because funding can be enslaving. We can be enslaved to log frames, and enslaved to this happened and this didn't happen. And then there is no flexibility to say, hey, look at your design. And if you feel like you need to change, can we talk? Because I feel like there needs to be that platform with the founder to say, hey, I'm seeing that the direction that this thing is moving, it's better to support this thing because projectively we are seeing that it will hit A, B, C, D, and then we see an exponential growth. So if Google Trust work with landscape uh, level, regeneration, grasslands, cropping, seed systems, food systems. But I promise you, in global community where we work, the most important thing for them sometimes to celebrate and to show that work happened and they would like to celebrate at the end of each growing season. We play soccer. Mm -hmm. Tournament, sports tournament brings 660 people together the whole day. You have quizzes that you run. There is game <laughs> there's games, there's everything for a full day till night and people win and everyone's happy and it's part of the work but it's got nothing to do with holistic plant grazing but it has everything to do with it because that's where we come and reconnect and join our energies. Mm. So that's just an example that sometimes I think it's good to to know where you're working and, and I they, feel like it's, yeah. it's it's oh. such a learning that ever, but I, there are more and more people who have have been in the world of funding good work around the world for many years, but have realized how much they also got stuck in a rut with um, KPIs and um, quantitative uh, assessment of impact, and how mm -hmm. how that has just um, made things more and more bureaucratic and. Um, made that less money actually did the good work because there's so much money just supporting people to fill in all the, the, mm -hmm. the uh, it's a um but there is this this stage in this this kind of when the small naturally grown out of passion and a few friends trying to make a difference by doing it yeah? mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. organizations do tend to not not because anybody wants to not be doing it correctly it's just you're so busy that you end up with an organization that probably has messy accounts and not fully auditable. Uh, it's and horrible. They, and, they, and they all do. Like I've, I mean, I've seen it here in, in Mallorca. It's like the small organizations, yeah. two or three people, it's like if a, if a kind of accountant of a big NGO walked into the, their management system, they, they'd go, ah, oh, drop this? dead. We'll be like, what is this? Like, <laughs> but, but, so, and but, it takes a long time to then build back the pieces together. Because definitely you can't you can't divide yourself into 
uh, accountant and then a project implementer and then a trainer and then a coach and mentee, uh, a mentor for the communities that you work for and a mentee also um, to others where you draw your source of strength and encouragement from. So it's really... It's it's very it's very dynamic, but I think as the team grows, <clears throat> I feel like then you have an opportunity to get a bit of funding to put your house in order so that you can fund other important pillars. But yeah, it's messy. <laughs> but it it's, is messy. But and, it's, and rightfully it's, so. A good mess. But it's for me it's it's one thing that that I've realized in the last year that simply the process of at a landscape scale um supporting those small organizations that are in that landscape at that like they've been around for a while they've done wonderful work they're really deeply committed to those people who are touched by them and and vice versa there's the trust has been built in this small pocket so to speak bringing those at the regional level together and giving them just that simple support, the, the the support of how do you clean up your act in terms of presenting what you do, um, not just as what the small organization, but as part of that regional network and, and getting all of those small organizations to that next level of, of kind of financial due diligence, like basically mm -hmm. the capacity to run through the due diligence process of a larger foundation. Now, that's that's mm -hmm. what so many of those small organizations don't have and they, yeah, but they but they need that systemic money and the way that they could find it is by not just being one small organization but mm -hmm. 10 15 in regionally bound in a in a landscape context cluster uh, partnerships yeah and, and then have the support for all of them to go through this process of because it, sometimes it can be um confrontational to people when you say are you books in order and they say yeah yeah of course mm -hmm. they are yeah and they mm -hmm. are to a certain mm -hmm. level but they're not in order in the sense that the, the due diligence process would would not raise the alarm yeah? mm -hmm. but so it's, mm -hmm. and and the, the interesting thing is that this particular sort of point in the development of reach like supporting small regional organizations to work together and to grow not in a kind of ah, let's scale it up, but grow mm -hmm. in a proper way. Um, it happens everywhere. Like it, I'm, what I'm describing to you now, that makes sense to you, in your context, is actually yeah. highly based on what I've learned here on Mallorca. Uh, wow! So, so it, it doesn't matter whether you're in a privileged place yeah. in Mallorca where there's billionaires slushing around the place. <laughs> um, yeah. It it still has that same issue. Uh, so fascinating. Um, Let's communicate that to the larger funders. Yes, that's really that's really a fantastic model too. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, I didn't get to share pictures. I'll have loved for people to see the where I come from. But well, one and a half hours is gone. <laughs> what, what, what I will do is I'll I'll um put it in the link at the bottom of the video um some uh, links to your website and yeah, the... that's good. Yes, because that's when everyone will yeah will totally see it. Yeah. Well, this but is. In... It, excited about everything that's possible so it's been really lovely and and um, really enjoyed this conversation and then um we'll still have one coming up um i'll, I'll send you an email and, and natalie to see what, whether we can find that time with for the voices of the regeneration recording with the two of you sounds and, good uh, with, the, with the, the regeneration rising i get confused with the two <laughs> this, this is the voices of the regeneration video cast that i just yes. do with friends and um, then there's this other thing that I do with the RSA Oceania, um, which is a podcast. And and I would okay. love to have you and um, Natalie together on, on that. And I'll, I'll... That is such an inspiration. I totally enjoyed your guys' uh, yeah. voice of regeneration. And I uh, totally enjoyed talking to you today. Hoping that I made sense. Funny story. Every time someone says, hey, I need to chat with you. I'm like, I don't have anything to share. So... <laughs> <laughs> lots of really crazy, amazing but stuff. i'm really grateful that we we spent such a beautiful time together and to let you know that you're so inspiring reading all your materials and everything is giving us all so much energy we're full charged up because you know people like you exist yeah likewise likewise thank I'm, you I'm, yeah I'm,
So hopefully we will meet again sometime in person. I I, I need to tell, tell us, awesome. need to bring us all together again. Find an excuse. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Bye. Okay. Bye.